Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you are in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building, Building Scale. scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Today's guest is Steve Carroll, who's the co-founder of Kelso Industries. With his lifelong friend and now business partner, Steve launched Kelso Industries in 2021 with the goal to build the nation's leading mechanical service company. He leads Kelso, which now has 14 different acquired business units and over 1,700 employees operating across the United States. Steve brings many years of leadership and industry experience to Kelso, having previously worked as an executive at Walmart and Sam's Club, where he built two different business units to beyond a quarter of a billion with a B uh, in revenue. Uh, he gained a foundation of knowledge and skills in the construction services uh, with CW Driver, Mortison Construction, and Clyde Companies. It was on projects in Southern California where Steve gained his passion for mechanical plumbing and HVAC trades. Kelso's companies provide HVACR, mechanical and plumbing services throughout the United States. Uh, and has been partnering with market-leading mechanical HVACR and plumbing services companies operating within the United States to enable owners to transition their careers, create new opportunities for employees, and further deepen customer relationships. So with that note, if you are uh, in the market to maybe uh, get a change, a little shake up at your business, Kelso may want to talk to you for sure. And with all that said, Steve, welcome to the show. Hey guys, Justin, Will, thanks for having me on. I'm super, super excited. excited. Yeah, yeah, super excited for this for this episode. Uh, we've had a number of conversations, and I always get goosebumps uh, talking to you because there's very few people out there that are doing what you're doing. So I'm excited. Yes, yeah, scalability to the max. So uh, before we dive into some of that stuff, tell us tell us your origin. I, I know I said uh, a bunch of great stuff, but tell us uh, how you how you really got into the industry. You know what what you saw at eleven, and then uh, tell us about Kelso. Yeah, that's great. So. Grew up in a rural part of Portland, Oregon, and I met my now co-founder in fourth grade at Kelso Elementary School, and uh, we we ran together for a while. We were roommates in college. He went different career path, and I went into commercial construction, project engineer, you know, boots on the ground, the guy in the trailer writing hundreds and some case thousands of RFIs and submittals. That was me and worked my way up in project management. Eventually decided to make a shift and learn more than uh, where I was you know, at on that part of my career. Went to graduate school in business, went to go work at Walmart at their headquarters and, and got a, you know, another master's degree in how big businesses run. Really enjoyed my time there, spent seven years there. I actually thought I'd only be there one or two years, so mad props to uh, Walmart and working for a big company like that. So really enjoyed my time there, but always wanted to get back into the trades in some way and was looking for a number of years for where that was going to be. And my favorite trades were the, the, the really complex trades on the job site and just drew me back to mechanical, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, early on in my my process and and here we are this is what we do full time now so you weren't you know you weren't the size of company that you were two and a half years ago where were you what size of company were you two and a half years ago before you started going down this route of acquisition yeah so we we started with a company in Arizona and I actually picked my family up and moved all the way out to Arizona from Arkansas. And in between that, actually, 
um, the, my co-founder and I, my partner and I, we lived in a residence in for six months. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, we, you know, we, we were, we we're going to make this thing happen and it wasn't easy, but, but, you know, we figured out how to manage a business across the country. And, uh, that business only was about 70 or 80 employees, you know, mid size small to mid size mechanical in our space and was a really good way for me to get a lot of learning and and learn the business from an estimating standpoint sales um managing recruiting um picking up checks from customers taking customers to lunch i i made a big push with the team to have a lot of lunches at the office there. So we had about 25 or 30 of our clients come through our office and have a, a lunch at the office. So it was just really boots on the ground, just learn the business from the ground up. And that that's what got this all started. So in two and a half years, you've gone through from 60, 70 people to what, 1700 ish people. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about, how does M&A strategy impact people? Yeah, so we took notes from what's worked and what hasn't worked with other companies in our space. And, and frankly, other companies in, in all sorts of M&A spaces, but particularly in our space. And there's, there's good use cases and there's bad use cases. And one of our favorite use cases is the one of the behemoths is comfort systems. They're you know Houston based, um, publicly traded, massive massive organization, um, formed in the '90s when twelve companies all came together at the same time and went public all at once, and started with scale, but allowed a lot of their business units to have some autonomy in how they they worked. And, and it's worked from them to to now where they they effectively have you know corporate coming in and supporting the business units and providing some integration support and strategies but you don't see comfort systems um, the same way as some other companies where other companies they might jam a whole bunch to cut together all at once and change all the branding and uh right away comfort systems doesn't change the branding when they when they buy your company and there's a process and a timeline it's very natural so so that's what we do and we have we have a back office integration strategy that we do but as far as the employees to your question will the the employees might start to get some interaction with us, um, some of the you know leadership, but by and large, most of the employees are still getting a paycheck from the same company, the same brand name. Um, vendors are paid the same way. Customers are, are are interacted with the same way because we we have a little bit of a different approach in how we do the transaction. We we try to limit the changes that happen in the process. So you said that there's a little bit of difference in the trend uh, transaction. Uh, for example, like with ownership, what are the owners? Yeah, do? yeah. So, so we have a we have a partnership approach, and we've we've leveraged this in you know nine out of ten of our deals, right? Like on average, nine out of ten. And um, the owner of that business, rather than retiring, sells their business to us a hundred percent but we partner with that owner where they roll a portion of the value of their business into acquiring Kelso shares. So they effectively become a partner with us at Kelso, just like all the rest of us that own shares at, at Kelso. And now all of a sudden we have a very vested interest together to grow Kelso together. And that person has a duty to continue to run their business and build their team. So we we also have succession plans and and we work through their goals whatever their personal goals are but we don't have a major transition that happens at the point of transaction 
So the businesses so, effectively continue running on as they were, uh, even though if you look deep enough, technically there there is another entity that is yeah ruling, yeah uh, and overarchingly. We're not we're not trying to hide the that Kelso's the owner of it, but from an operational standpoint, the the teams are able to do what they're good at and be the experts in their field that they are and serve their clients in the way that they've successfully done for many years. And and we're buying companies that have been around for a long time. Our our oldest company has been around since 1933. Ooh, we're buying wow. businesses that have great 90 years. That's a long yeah. that's, a, that's an old company. Yeah, it is. And a lot of our companies have been around for, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, you know, 50 plus years. And so we're buying companies that have great processes, great systems. And over time, we're we're working together instead of coming in and saying we're just going to change everything all at once. We're not we're not. It's not what we're trying to do. Um, changing everything all at once in an acquisition strategy is 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 risky in my mind. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Then you got things to worry about like churn, client churn, employee churn. I mean, all that change. People hate change. Yeah, yeah. Customers it's... hate it. Vendors hate it. Employees. Yeah, it's. We, we do have change that we have to work through, but it's much more natural and it's, it's good change, right? If we, if, if there's things we can do to make the business better, we do it together. So, all right. So talk about a little bit about, um, do all employees keep exactly their jobs, right? So you've come in, uh, you've obviously done some due diligence. Does everyone stay in the job that, uh, that they've been in or do some changes get made? You said that, you know, you don't want to make a lot of changes. Uh, but some of the point of going in is to create some efficiencies, right? In order to be able to, I mean, really to become a better, better or as, as you get bigger, you, you have the ability to create efficiencies. You want to talk a little bit about that from the employee perspective? Yeah, so... Right out of the gate, the only thing that really will feel any change is the finance department. The finance department, you know, they'll work more often with our corporate CFO. And, you know, we've got, you know, certain reporting that we have to do that's probably new for the company. And we're very upfront with that, right? There's we're, there's certain things that we just have to be able to do right away. But by and large, if you're a project manager, a service manager, a technician, a foreman, you know, even divisional presidents in our companies by and large don't feel any any major changes, right? Like from an operation standpoint, you continue to do what you're really good at. It's, you know, the ownership, finance team, we're, we have to work through certain things together with, you know, whether it's a bank account we have to go to our bank accounts. You know, there's certain things that we have to do, but boots on the ground, folks out in the field. Hey, you're joining a bigger organization for sure. So you've got a lot of stability and coming over and we're going to try to grow the business with the ownership and the leadership. So you've got a job for as long as you're willing to work and, and produce and, and be a productive team member. Your, your job's solid. So we, we try to help people in their careers with the acquisition process and grow and keep the company more, you know, more efficient, more busy. But at the same time, we're not trying to merge companies together and fire people because we're merging them together. That's not our strategy. So this isn't uh, a mash and resell uh, type of, type of you know, strategy. You're, no. trying to, you're trying to actually build something here, not necessarily for resale, but to build some to build some value. Yeah. Be- so in part of it is, you know, we're buying businesses that are, are complete businesses. Uh, we, we like to think of it as a business in a box, right? If they, if a business can effectively run and produce the profitability that we're, we feel we're partnering with and buying, then we want to keep that going. We want that to continue to, to thrive. Now, if the business you know, we know there's improvements that need to be made because the business isn't thriving. 
we don't buy a lot of those businesses. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to buy that business that's already, you know, a market leader and needs, needs some financial strength and support from a bigger organization to go to the next level. Okay. So you're not going in there to just to fix things, uh, like with smaller companies, you're going in there with, with a completely different strategy, uh, around gaining efficiencies, um, like marketing sales, right? The op- actual operations, a lot of that stays same or similar. Yeah, totally. I mean, really the only thing that's changing because of the type of businesses we're partnering with and acquiring is insurance. You know, we we're able to get much cheaper insurance as a part of our bigger company. So there's generally speaking some savings there. A lot of software, you know, accounting systems that we use, it's cheaper going through us because we're a bigger buyer of those systems than they are buying on their own. So we're consolidating in that way, but, you know, go to market, you know, sales, any of that stuff. We see those things as very much regional and necessary to support our customer base. Okay. Um, What about departments? Are you grouping them together? So as you buy these companies at a box, Are there efficiencies to be gained, you know, not just geographic division right now, it's geographically divided, but uh, what about divisions, you know, with HVAC? uh, Yeah. So, yeah. So we we're implementing, you know, business strategies that are, you know, you might hear the Rockefeller habits or EOS or some of those different um, philosophies out there where, You do gain efficiencies when you're able to function, you know, cross function in training, but also in um, inside of function. So we have HR across our companies. We have estimating across our companies. We have sales and service across our companies. Um, We are we're starting with finance to where in the past, these finance leaders in these companies were kind of on their own. Where if you're a part of, say, a $50 million HVAC mechanical company or maybe even $100 million, you're kind of on your own as a finance leader. You might have an outside third-party account that you work with you know, once a year for taxes or occasionally here or there. Now you're part of a bigger company where there's you know, multiple other regional CFOs and controllers that you have meetings with on a regular basis and you have the opportunity to develop best practices together hey you're doing your reporting monthly like this oh that's great that's that's better i can do mine faster if i follow your strategy right um how you're paying vendors you know cash management all that all that stuff we're developing functional expertise across all of our companies and we can we're we're stronger as a result, you know. If if someone were to get hit by a bus, we we hope that would never happen, right? But if we were, we're we're communicating as a group in the finance department where we can help each other out and help support that business unit should something happen. Um, the next steps where we're going to is, um, and we, we've also done this from the president's level too. We're spending more and more time as a group from a president's standpoint our, our you know our divisional presidents running our business units um we're going to this next year even take that further in like i was saying hr we'll do the same thing for hr we'll do the same thing for safety um serving you know some of our bigger accounts like walmart or target we'll have the leaders from the different businesses getting together more often to discuss how to work with that that client. Um, so you can kind of develop some specialization throughout the whole company that brings strength beyond just one business unit operating in a vacuum. And that that's that's some of the other benefit of being a part of a bigger company. That's great. Being able to ask a question and then someone else maybe even having the answer within your company, mm-hmm. right? That had you been a smaller size company, even the 90 year old company might not have had that answer because who else do you go to now all of a sudden you have some expertise within the company it stays inside of the company that's yeah that's beautifully thought out yeah it uh, 
I would say IT's, you know, pretty high on that list. Um, as I'm sure you guys would appreciate, we want to have a always, similar always. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna have a similar strategy from an IT standpoint as well. We do have we do have some of those IT professionals in our companies, and we don't want them to be on an island operating on their own either. Right. So this is where the you know consolidating into a single strategy get everyone to sort of row in the same direction. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you talked, all of this really revolves around something that we haven't talked about, which is the goal, right? What's the goal? What's the long-term goal? The BHAG, the 10-year, 20-year vision. Talk to us a little well, bit about that. I can't, I can't talk about the goal without saying our, our mission um, mm -hmm. and our vision and, you know, like giving you more of who we are, right? So we are focused in mechanical today, but we're we're expanding more and more into MEP and um, industrial. So a lot of our clients are manufacturing plants, paper and pulp, um, all sorts of different types of manufacturing. It's it's a growing and exciting part of our business. Um, data centers, you know, very heavy mechanical systems. And so we want to become the nation's preferred mechanical and industrial service partner. That's kind of our, that's our vision that we put out there of what we're building. And I'm excited to say that we're, we're making efforts to become the nation's preferred MEP and industrial service provider. So we're really covering a lot of those really technical trades for our clients. So we're one call for that client. That's what we're trying to build. Um, you know, we have our core values, which we strive to live every day. That's partnership. We've talked a lot about partnership today. Innovation. We try to grow. We're trying to improve every day and everything that we do. Safety. We're out there doing some complex work, moving around some heavy equipment. We need our guys to be safe. We need our team to be safe. Also, we're safe operators of our business financially. So our partners know they can partner with us that we're not going to do things that are outrageous from a financial standpoint. And excellence. We're trying to be the best. We're not trying to be the mediocre service provider. We're always trying to climb that ladder to be better, which those things we feel help us achieve our vision to become at that national level that, that we've talked about. Um, we, we empower our teams to grow, innovate, and deliver results is our mission of what we're trying to do every day, right? We're a people-driven organi people organization. We have to listen to what our teams are doing. We want to support them. Um, we're not just making widgets and, you know, sending widgets to Walmart to sell. We're all of us producing every single day from that 1700 list that we have. So that's kind of the foundation of what Kelso is. It's a services organization. And our, our BHAG, it, it's going to continue to evolve. It's going to continue to grow, right? The BHAG, the, the, um, hairy audacious goal, right? Like we're, we're trying to be something big. Um, what, what we are today is probably a, a middle, middle of the road player in our space. We're not like a top 10, but we're, we're, we want to become a top 10, a top three in our space. Right. And in that, in that vein, in order to be a top three, we need to be, you know, billions of dollars. Um, so we've got, probably at least a 10 X goal on top of where we're at right now to even be in that, in that discussion. And someday we want to be the biggest. So it, you know, five to 20 year goals that we're talking about here, but everybody's, everybody's trying to be the best inside of our company. Nobody's trying to just be like, Oh, we're, you know, we're fine being small. No. We are not. We we want to be among the best in our industry. That would go against your core values, wouldn't it? <laughs> exactly. Excellence and innovation. We we we're working this week. It's Thanksgiving week, right? 
nobody's nobody's sitting at home doing nothing. Like we're we're hungry. That's awesome. So obviously, M and A uh, as a strategy for growth and scale makes tons of sense. What about on the organic side? What uh, you know, obviously, you you want to grow via acquisition, but uh, there's also you know to get to the places you want to get to. It's also growing the those bases out just organically. What does that look like for you? Hundred percent. So. Organic growth in our industry can come in different forms, right? You can offer different service lines. You can expand into another geography. You can start serving more customers and just do more of what you already do. I'd say we have initiatives across all of our companies to do all of those things in various forms. Um, We're very thoughtful on organic growth because probably similar to your industry on the IT industry, you're somewhat um, limited with the skill set and the staff that you have. And you can you can outsell a little bit, but you don't want to outsell too much. Mm-hmm. You expand too much and you're having to take staff that may not be prepared for growth and you provide less customer service, less quality customer service less excellence for your customers. And so we're very careful to not have aggressive growth goals in our space. We've, all of us have singed our our fingers trying to grow at at a rate that's out, you know, we're not ready for. Some of our business units have been investing for 20 years and it's just in their DNA. They grow every year, they're investing and they're growing. And we just, we support that growth. Uh, Some of our business units have just a really awesome service that they offer and a customer base that loves what they do. And we do that for them day in and day out. And we're happy to grow at at the rate that the, you know, the customers need and that we can support. Um, But we have some business units that are very aggressively growing and taking a lot of market share. And we're really excited about it because we're just going to support them and we're going to continue to grow and, um, but for companies that come join us, we're more or less there to support them. And we work the arrangement early on. We know what that needs to be like. What's great is that because you're, you know, the size of your company already, if one business unit is doing a lot better th- uh, than the other, um, you have the ability to absorb that, uh, within your company, you can shuffle people around within your company. Rather than oh, trying yeah. to go from the outside, which is awesome, right? Not you, you can't do that as a smaller company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, we have a we have a good example of that where the other day one of our business units um, was projecting a little bit of a in between a lull in between projects and some of our service work we're doing for our client, and another business unit on the the north side of that state had a whole bunch more work than they had crews. And so we were able to send a crew up to that other business unit. We are able to generate revenue. That crew didn't have to sit at home. They got a paycheck that week. Mm-hmm. You know, they got their paid, you know, paid well and didn't have to sit at home. So the company was able to generate more revenue as being a part of a bigger company versus you know losing that revenue and not having the 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 paycheck for those seven or eight guys this this is what it means to have efficiencies right reducing the amount of downtime you know uh like for example one of your crews and yet also not sacrificing client you know the client experience the client service uh on the flip side right in what might look like overrun had it just been them on their own it could have also turned out really bad so just shuffling around like that you're able to create a win-win situation um that only really works when you have that bigger company bigger scale to and uh, i think communication along with it to be able to do that yeah yeah we have to communicate right that's why those open lines of communication are are so important like what we were just talking about you 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 have to have that cross-functional communication to even have a chance to do that. So yes, we have our different business units, but we're communicating, we're supporting each other. Should this one fall down, we help support the other one 
in, in their needs. So, Are you doing a lot of, um, I know you'd mentioned the presidents having more, you know, crossing over in regards to um, working together. Uh, Nis, are you finding that that's maybe the next stage? Obviously you don't want to, like your approach is like, we want the businesses to operate as the businesses were. And like what, you know, we looked at the business and thought the business was good. So like, we're not necessarily trying to change it, but are you finding that like, oh, well, if there's a business that they just have figured out lead generation or they've figured out more marketing aspect and this other company has figured out client experience, like how, like, man, they deliver client experience to the, the A++ level. Are you finding that these presidents are getting together and saying like, hey, how can we come together, collaborate to just make our individual business units better? Um even if it's like, oh, historically, you've been more this client driven, historically, you've been more growth driven and like, however that shakes out. But are you finding that's the case that they're just coming together and like the collaboration creates this magic? Yeah, there, there's so many examples of that. We could probably spend hours talking about the that <laughs> right there. Um, a lot of the collaboration does breed the magic though, right? Um, hey, if you're, if you're partners with somebody and they've solved a problem, and you don't have to try to, you know, rack your brain about how to fix that problem. You're gonna, you're gonna have, you know, the humility to say, "Hey, I'll, I'll I like that. Let me do that, just like you did." And yeah, so many examples of that from, you know, websites. Um, even we've even rebranded one of the businesses because they wanted to be a part of a, the bigger business unit in the region. It was servicing a lot of the clients and estimating sales, you know, how they support their clients. Um, there was also, there has been a lot of um, support and, and cross training in those business units. So that's been really fun to see. And one really cool example that's come out of that is because a few of our business units in Utah have collaborated so well, multiple different companies came together and won a large retrofit project. A building in downtown Salt Lake is an office building right now. But as you know, office space has been having troubles all across the US and the government's even supporting real estate companies now to retrofit those buildings to multifamily. And so we were able to win a project where we really wouldn't have been in consideration on our own, but because we were able to provide all the plumbing, all of the hydronic HVAC work, all of the sheet metal work, all of the complex systems that were necessary for that building with one contract, one relationship, we we're able to win that, that project. Again, it's a big project. It's 26 stories, but it's going to happen really fast because it's an existing building. And we love that work, right? We're we're more or less retrofitting that building in a matter of a few months. Uh, we have the resources to do it. We're in a short list of companies that can even do that work effectively. Wow. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's another example of consolidation where, hey, those two companies previously didn't even know each other or if they did they certain certainly wouldn't have collaborated like that as well as they did and now you know there are they're right in the middle of that project and crushing it that's awesome that's like the testament of like you know better together right like that's like people say this but then you know it's hard to execute when you're in you're in a market because it's like there's you generally your competitors right like that's generally how it works but like mm -hmm. when you can facilitate this type of behavior, it's like you can do bigger and better things if you just come together to do it. Uh, and it's cool that obviously them both being under the Kelso uh, flagship. Now it's so obvious to them. And like, this is the first of probably many that they'll be able to execute at mm -hmm. that level. You know? Yeah, that's the goal, right? If I can replicate that across all the different types of services and all the markets that we off that we operate in, and then you expand that to all the markets that we're not in. You can see we've got a very big strategy that can grow to multi billions. We're only, you know, we have 14 offices. We're in nine states with brick and mortar. We'll travel, 
but imagine a day where we're able to have brick and mortar in all the major cities and all the major markets and be able to support clients in that way where we are a one-stop shop in every single city. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So we can't talk about this aggressive growth without talking about money. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? How are you funding this quite aggressive M&A growth? How are yeah. you doing that? Yeah. So I, I'm the operations side, I, I, you know, management, that's, that's been my career. That's what I, that's what I love. And I'm, I'm good at, I love working with our teams. My partner, he is, you know, he's the brains behind the capital and I will say it's a, um, it's a different world that I've had to learn a lot about and support in from, from my seat and my role. But he has uh, done a wonderful job in making sure that we have all the forms of capital necessary at the various stages necessary to keep growing. And we, you know, we've had and we continue to have really, really awesome world class equity and debt um, partners that have joined up with us and um more are are wanting to come on board and that's that's his that's his realm of expertise and so we we see no end in sight because we've got a a machine that we've built and there's recognition from the capital markets to to want to be involved so you start you so you got that flywheel going and now like people are seeing that flywheel is continuing to just gain speed yeah yeah, absolutely. And um, it's it's an effort, right? Like in my seat, I have to report up to our shareholders and uh, my partner helps a lot with that. Uh, he's got a lot of expertise there and making sure that we do things the right way. But you you have to manage um, you have to manage your your investors and support them with their questions and um just like you would in any big company, you've got shareholders. You have you might have a board if you're a bigger company. You have to you have to be that leader that uh, manages up and man, and manages down at the same time. And uh, the capital is is a very important part of our business, and it will it will always be an important part of our business as we consider them partners as well. So, uh, capital is super important, but who you're working with might not be who you're necessarily working with in the future. They want usually family offices, PE firms, et cetera, want a return after X amount of time, or th is this really a buy and hold strategy? And the return will be when you essentially gain all that market share, the return will come from profitability. Um, So returns are, are important part of the capital markets. Um, there's different ways that you can get returns for your capital partners, but our capital partners know there's a season in which they'll be with us and um, a season which they won't. And, you know, we work with them on their goals too. And we listen to what they need. But first and foremost, we're, we're going to do the right things for, for our shareholders and to build the to build the business so that it has a a long runway so that Kelso can become that, you know, top three, top five, top three player in our industry. We've got to have investors and partners that understand what it takes to get there. A lot of our investors want to see us get there. So frankly, not, not everyone wants to just, you know, sell their shares and, and run away either. So there's a there's gonna there'll be an interesting journey as we go through that over the next five to ten years. But um again, like my my partner Steve Nicholson, he's he's an expert in in sourcing and and partnering with those groups. So we so we don't have to, you know, so the business is never at risk. Let me just put it that way. Okay. So he's He's an architect, but not not in the traditional sense. He's a he's a financial architect. Is yeah a, a better way of, of talking about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's lots of different ways to source capital, and um, you have to put that together in the proper way to so we can achieve our goals. What would you what say? What are to some the... of the? Go ahead. Go ahead, Justin. 
what are what are some of the things you've learned during this m a process right like what are things that you maybe and not to say that like any deal good bad or otherwise but it's like things that you've learned as you've gone on now you're 14 deep in effectively two and a half years uh a lot of changes occurred has the process adjusted the m a process adjusted as as each deal's gone on or each couple deals have gone on yeah, certainly a ton of learning over this. You know, I didn't come from the M and A world. I came from you know management and corporate and construction. So I've had to learn a ton. Um, I think the the process is probably a, a a proven process that that like my partner he had already done this a bunch of times, right? So it was all new to me. Um, maybe early on, we were figuring out the right way to structure our deals and partner with our, our companies to where it was maybe a little more raw. And um, the process was, um, it was, it was still a good process, but maybe it, it took a little longer than we, we need to. Um, we know how to push, where to push. We have our various consultants, legal, accounting, insurance. We've really dialed that in a lot. And those groups know what we need. They've, you know, those, almost all of those folks were there from the beginning and, you know, figuring out what was important in this trade was a process. Um, making sure that we're protecting ourselves, but also protecting our other shareholders and making sure that it's a successful deal for everyone, including the group that's selling the company to us. And um, one of the things that's been interesting to me is, is there is a bit of a competition in this space. And there's a fair amount of groups that are trying to do what we're doing and, and if, in, in a lot of ways successfully doing what we're doing. We weren't the first and we're certainly not the last, but we're getting better at identifying reasons why groups would want to partner with us. So we're, we're probably a little more fast to um, partner with or weed out groups that wouldn't be a good fit. Um, but there's, there's just a lot of companies that are a good fit. So it's a lot of fun to, you know, get to know and meet those companies early on and, and get them into our process. And um, gosh, we could talk about this part for a while, Justin. I think there's been a lot of learnings, but uh, I think just narrowing down and zeroing in on what what we're looking for has probably been the, the awesome, most awesome learning that we've had because that's allowed us to go faster. No, that makes tons of sense. When you uh, it's, I mean, it's like, it's same as like sales and marketing. When you identify the actual who it makes things easy. Like it, like, you know, if everybody's on the table, it's always more difficult to say that's the one because you have so right. many possibilities. So when you really can say it looks a lot closer to this, it makes that look that clarity about the whom, uh, yeah, I could see how that would be, uh, huge, 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 huge. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just kind of add to that, right? Like, Early on, we we did kind of think we would boil the ocean, and we'd we'd buy any company in in our space, and you know, if you have clients, we will buy you. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what we thought for sure, and um, probably wasted a lot of time early on, which is why if you look at our our history, we we only got we got one deal done May twenty twenty one. We it took us an entire year before we got the second one done, May 2022. So the amount of learning that we had over that year from operating the business, finding the next partners, finding who is the next group to buy, what we're not going to buy, we kind of, we stubbed our toes all over the place. Um, but narrowing in and zeroing in on what we're looking for was absolutely a key to this, this whole thing. And that that's allowed us to just go much faster. That makes it even more impressive because that's really like 13 deals in a year and a half in comparison to 14 in two and a half years. So that's yeah. that year, uh, 
whatever whatever the process you did to figure out that year uh, has worked out well, I would say, as an outsider perspective, just looking at raw metrics. <laughs> It was critical. It was pivotal to this to this whole thing. I I don't even I don't even know how people do it without having a year to like just figure it out. Unless you come from the industry and you know everything about it, right? So I had to learn. I had a lot to learn. Did you have to upskill any of your employees uh, in this process? Um. When you say upskill, do you mean top grade, like replace people? Well, either uh, re- either replace or educate, send them to programs, management, training, right? Because the whole, it, it's not organic, right? Yes, you have an organic side to your growth. But when you are essentially, when you're doing the acquisitions, right, and sort of merging up, what you do in that type of a company versus one that only, you know, uses, let's say, debt to finance, you know, internal activities that are not M&A based to grow organically. Those are two mm-hmm. completely different companies. Right. Right. And so how you operate them, uh, how you grow, how your people respond is different. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, so for the for the people that started with. And especially that you, you talked about stubbing your toes in that first year. Um, what about the people there? How did you get it so that they understood how to do it? How, and then you started getting this flywheel going. Yeah. that That's a fun topic. Um, there, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of learnings in how to, you know, support and bring the right management in. I'd say that first business that we bought was probably our hardest in that journey. The husband and wife that were running that business, they left, right? So I lost the number one and the number two in that business. Um, we have not done that in any of our other deals. And and that was that was a very hard thing to swallow and deal with and and that was probably the genesis for our partnership strategy that we employ now and one of the reasons why partnership is doing so well is we're not changing out those those roles um we have we have had to um, work on some management aspects of some of our businesses. I'd probably say the first business that we bought, there's probably been more in that one. Um, cause I effectively, you know, moved myself out and, you know, built up the team around me and, you know, allowed me to move out from running that business. So there was some skill growth, leadership improvement, opportunities inside of that company probably more than anywhere else um we have sent some of those leaders to leadership training there's there's industry training um in phoenix that we've been able to send some folks to and um we we have been able to find very you know talented people in our industry that want to come work for us and and we've been able to promote a lot of great people up inside of the company as well and so that that is a example of a business that we're very excited for the future of that business as we have probably our newest generation of leaders running that business. A lot of the other companies, it's the previous owners running that those business units. And so a lot less leadership change going on from an operation standpoint. Um, I will say something that we've done that I'm really proud of is on the finance side of our business, we have um, we have been able to work with a lot of the finance folks inside of our companies. And in some cases, we've been able to bring in um, a regional CFO model to support the finance teams inside of the companies that we bought. And in some cases, the the companies had the regional CFO or regional controller already in place, and they're able to report directly into our CFO at Kelso. And so um, 
haven't had to do a ton of leadership turnover or anything like that, but we have succession plans for all of our businesses. And we have some of our business units where the presidents and the leaders do want to retire. And so we've got a plan we're working through with them where the next generation will come in. The next set of leaders are already running the business in a lot of those cases and transitioning out that leader that wants to retire. So um, we do spend a lot of time in this area. Succession planning is very, very important. Uh, We don't want to push anybody out. Um, especially our leaders that want to be there, that are successful, that like what they're doing. We want them to stay there. But for somebody that has a plan to retire or move on or, you know, do something else with their time, um, we're there to help and support too. So we, we, we bring a lot of value in that way. That's awesome. It, it not, uh, you know, obviously when you hear, we want this partnership partnership model in comparison to I'm, I'm acquiring, you're going to be gone in a year. Um, people don't think about succession planning because you're inherently keeping it. So you're like, oh, well, you know, I think that's probably something that gets forgotten about a lot. And the fact that you're already doing that um, is just so smart, right? You know, we we talk about scalability, how do you keep things um, rolling, keeping the flywheel rolling. And like, if you if you lose leadership, that that makes a massive blow. So to like already start saying like, hey, there are already younger leaders in a company that are starting to do some of the, the activities that are necessary that would be, oh yeah, once, once, you know, in five, 10, whatever years that you're, you know, somebody wants to retire, uh, then it's like, oh, okay. We already have that built in, which is really, really cool. Yeah. I think it just creates a healthy environment where there's less fear about what, 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 what could happen if things don't go well or someone, you know, gets hit by a bus, right? It's terrible. Terrible example, right? But if someone does, we don't want the business to suffer. We've got a lot of employees and mouths to feed and families that depend on us to do a good job. We uh, frequently use uh, win the lottery and move to a remote island. That's effectively, if somebody wins the lottery and moves to a remote island, what do we do? Uh, yeah, there you go. The bus. No, 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 for sure. That's better uh, than the bus. <laughs> uh, it's also uh, probably helps in regards to not only culture and generality, but also helps with any form of possibility of employee churn, right? Because if you feel like you're, you can't level up ever, like you're just stuck like in that middle management or whatever that kind of level would be, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes after X amount of time for certain people. So the fact it's like, oh no, like succession planning is a thing we're already thinking about. You would be in line or, you know, there's a, there's a path to get to that point. That becomes super, super attractive to just keep high level people in in the business. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we want to know if there's somebody that's, you know, a star performer that wants an opportunity, but there isn't one. That's another reason why, you know, buying all these companies and partnering with all these companies is so great is, hey, we got opportunity for days. If you want more opportunity, we're going to find something for you. And um, there's no, nobody's stuck, right? Just communicate up and, you know, communicate to your leaders what you want to do and give opportunities um, to, to folks below you to learn your part of the business so you can move on to something else. Absolutely. We're, we're working on that in multiple cases inside of our company. Yeah. And as you acquire more or grow more, however, that's done in multiple cities, multiple locations, multiple states, and it just opens up other possibilities for other positions to just then be created, right? It's like, we don't yeah. have a Hawaii division yet. Uh, but maybe we do eventually one day. And, and that's the thing that you want to run, right? Uh, obviously, everybody wants to run the Hawaii division. Um, <laughs> but, none, but nonetheless, uh, you get a- and as you add in the other services, and who knows, in 10 years from now, it could be services that you're not even thinking about offering yet that you will be offering, right? So um, it just brings the opportunity is just so much greater, like in comparison yeah. to when they were at the even a 200 person company, which would be, you know, mm-hmm. very sizable, right? Like it's, there's just a limit. The ceiling is now raised so exponential for those, especially those that really want to grow and, and do more. So that's awesome. To yeah. Hear. Yeah. That that's part of the value I feel is, Hey, if you're in a certain level inside of a company inside of Kelso, you just got to start communicating. 
And you, if you're willing to move, if you're willing to take another opportunity, if you're willing to, you know, take a little bit of a risk, we'll support you. And we want you to go do well. Cause that, that means Kelso's doing well. Yeah, for sure. So I want to switch gears here for a second, take something that you had said earlier, uh, which is you're buying businesses in a box, right? Now, the industry has been known to be behind uh, in certain places. And one of those places is cybersecurity. Is cybersecurity something that you guys are thinking about? And if so, how or how has it affected you guys? Yeah, I mean, you you have to think about it in business. Um, there's, um, there's plenty unscrupulous groups out there that are constantly um attacking our our companies and um in some cases they've had some success and so we've had to upgrade our our systems and processes and you know we've enjoyed our um communications with you guys so far obviously this this is a this is something we have to continue to improve on and evaluate and um we 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 just can't sit on the sidelines forever and let it get worse and worse. So there's, there's definitely efforts and interest to make sure that we're not falling behind from a cybersecurity standpoint. A little bit of education uh, for, uh, for our listeners. Um, We have heard of deals literally get blown up 10, 20, $30 million deals that get uh, blown up because the cyber attackers They've been sitting within the company for a while, and then they see that the actual transition might be happening. And they, and so in order to get paid, you know, because there's a lot of timelines that happen during transactions. And if they don't get met, then things blow up. Or, uh, and so essentially bad guys will blackmail, uh, will blackmail the acquired. Or acquiring company because they know money is coming in uh, as a way to help get the deal through. And so the way they do it is they'll, let's say, ransom the entire organization and go, hey, pay us and we'll let, we'll let you go and then you can finish your deal. What actually happens is the deal gets blown up for like a year because then they didn't spend enough on cyber and then the entire valuation of the entire company has to get changed over because they had to spend more on cyber than they ever have before, right? Essentially locking the barn doors after all the horses have been let out. So, and the bigger the company is, the more likely that that's, that's to happen. And so that along with, let's say the accounting side, anyone that touches finances, if the bad guys are in there, um, during a, during trans, uh, during, a transition, it's the best time to get some checks sent out or some accounting information gets sent out because if there's any miscommunication, guess what? Bad guys might get paid a few more million. So these are actual things, actual events that we've heard of uh, uh, that happen. And um, if cyber isn't part of, let's say, your PL and actually, you know, just like sales, SGNA, right? Uh, a sales general, general administration, cyber needs to be part of that as well. If it's not part of the PNL, uh, these are the type of things that happen. And so you've heard it here. You know, it it affects it affects transactions. Um, so, uh, were there any big decisions or shifts in the company regarding technology? You said you kept you kept things the same. Part of it is because of the partnership, uh, you know, doing doing things as as partner. Are there any, uh, or will there be any big shifts, or is it more like a five year plan? Yeah. So uh, a lot of the back office sides of our business do have, you know, systems and technology, and a lot of our companies are are using a variety of accounting systems and a variety of expense management systems, insurance. I mean, the list goes on and on. So we are consolidating those down into a a single accounting uh, technology system, uh, which, which helps a ton versus having, you know, the individual companies having different 
you know, outputs from a reporting standpoint. So we're very excited to be on one accounting system, um, you know, payroll providers, those kinds of things we're, we're looking at. And from a technology standpoint, there's some operation systems out there that we're, we're evaluating as potential for, you know, a Kelso wide technology and operating platform. Um, and, and there's a lot of in, investment from those software companies, I would say, to go after this space in, in the accounting systems to go after the space. So I think there's just a lot of need to have better, you know, secure cloud-based KPI data-driven, simple user interface technology systems out there. But we, we're evaluating and I'm, I'm excited to say, well, we'll have a few of those things on a corporate wide system next year. You know, coming from the background of, of construction, uh, would you say that any of what you had talked about, you wouldn't consider yourself like technical savvy, right? Where on the, or how technical savvy would you consider yourself in comparison to let's say peers in your position? Uh, I mean, I'm not like a software engineer, but um, one of my roles when I was at Walmart was uh, product management. So I did spend a lot of time working with software engineers and evaluating technology. And um, I'd probably say I'm on probably the higher end in the space. You know, construction in general tends to be more paper and blue collar. And when I first got in the industry, people were still faxing us files and RFIs and different <laughs> things like that. So um, probably on the higher end of the the competency level from a technology standpoint, I'm I'm sure there's always people that that know more. But just having that breadth of experience when I was at Walmart in particular, I think gave me a good understanding of what good can look like. All right, you heard it here, folks. What good can look like. <laughs> um, so. Looking forward, because the growth rate in the last 13 months has been incredible, what size range do you think you're going to be at by the end of 2024? About 12 uh, months, 20... 13 months from now. Yeah, another 12, 13 months will we'll be another 30, 35% bigger, at least. Wow. That's yeah. some that's some great size. That's some great growth right there. And at that's at the size that you're at already. Most people would be happy with five percent growth, right? Yeah. Now, uh, not us. We got we've got big goals, and we we have quite a few bigger opportunities and groups that are going to be joining us over the next you know few months and and six months. Um, yeah. Well, we're we're not slowing down anytime soon. Um, thank you for that uh, that insight, Justin. I think it's that time. Yeah, for sure. So we love to ask this question to everybody uh, that comes on the show. Uh, so we're going to ask it to you. So if you could go back 20 years, what would you tell yourself? What advice would you give you? That'll be t 2004 when this episode gets released. So uh, in 2004, what advice would you have given yourself? Oh, wow. 2004? Yeah, it hurts when you actually hear the the date or the actual year. Twenty years ago doesn't. That's you know whatever. That could be any time, but two thousand four makes it real. <laughs> yeah, that I was in college. Um, what advice would I give myself? So you're gonna buy Bitcoin and Google and Apple stock. That's that's pretty obvious. But other other than that, what maybe what. Business advice or what personal advice doesn't always have to be business driven. Just things that you say, hey, you know, whatever, whatever you think would be a, a sage advice from your today self. Man, I, I, I would, I would say definitely learn more about finance. Um, that's probably an area that I, I, you know 
took me all the way until recently to understand how the capital markets work. I'd probably have spent a little more time learning that that knowledge and that skill set and probably seek out um, seek out a little bit different mentors. Uh, the people that you know and the knowledge is only part of it, but the people that you know is is everything in in business and in life. And um, I wanted to get into real estate development back then. And, um, you know, 2007, 2008, you know, really messed up my plans. And so I, I would probably <laughs> go back and say, don't, don't do that. <laughs> Get involved in something that's going to be around before and after the crash. Yeah, no, totally. That makes sense of sense. Um, awesome. This has been a ton of fun. We're going to throw all of your uh, social uh, and all that kind of stuff in the show notes. But if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that, Steve? Yeah, come find me on LinkedIn. I spend a decent amount of time on there. I'd be happy to connect with anybody that has more questions. Um, you can look up, you can Google Steve Carroll, you can Google Kelso Industries. Uh, I'll be there on the first page of Google, wherever you search for me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, well, we had a whole bunch of fun. Uh, I hope you did as well. And I hope our listeners uh, also had a good time. Uh, and until next time, adios. Adios. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Building Scale. To help us reach even more people, please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep, keep building, building scale. scale.